Uh, my name is Ron Foster, and myself and uh, some other couples stayed out at the uh, Whitehead uh, Island Lighthouse Station. And uh, one evening they had um, Jeremy Donchamont came out, and he had uh, Russ Lane, who's with us this evening. And uh, Russ's father was alive. His name is Russ Lane. And his okay. mother was there. And um, Russ, uh, Russ Lane Sr. was the lighthouse keeper at Whitehead uh, Lighthouse Station. And uh, he made a rescue at one time. And years later, I think Russie found an article about it and started to ask his dad about it. And um, so we thought that was, uh, he showed us a movie that he had made. Um, and we thought it was very interesting. We really enjoyed it. So I invited Russy, uh, asked if he would show it to our group. And he agreed. And so he's here with us tonight and I'll let him talk. And uh, so this is Russy Lane. Great, thank you everyone. Um, um, Dad was a lighthouse keeper on eight uh, light, lighthouses um, to, in the, um, uh, Eagle Island, um, uh, um, uh, Marshall Point, a lot of them down around um, 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 uh, Final Haven. And uh, so and he had a lot of stories. And, uh, but he, there was a rescue that happened and, we, and I always heard of it, but he never, never asked, um, 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 uh, never talked, t t talked on it at all. So years later, I, I asked him, and he's like, I think I can remember. But, well, I started looking, and it was very interesting to me to, 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 to uh, hear it. So let's, let's just uh, um, uh, look at it now, and then, then I'll come, come back. Here we go. My dad always said that he wasn't a hero. But dad, you have the newspaper article to prove it. Don't be like me, son. Go make something of yourself. But I just knew Dad was a hero. Now all I had to do was prove it to him. My parents must have felt like they were being dropped off at the end of the earth that cold winter day. The Coast Guard boat pushed away chunks of ice as they came along the tall granite dock. It was low tide, but Dad said it was always low tide when you had to unload a boat. He made several trips up the ladder with their belongings. My mother climbed up on her own and waited at the top. On his final trip, Dad cradled two-month-old Becky in one arm and carefully climbed the crooked iron rungs with the other. With the new lightkeeper and his family safely on the dock, the boat captain yelled up, We're heading back to Rockland. Call the base if you need anything. Abandoned without a boat, my parents walked the icy road to the other side of the island and the lighthouse they would call home for two years. After meeting up with the other crew members, they soon discovered the base at Rockland was stretched far too thin to provide them much transportation. Fortunately, they found themselves being shuttled to and from the island through the generosity of mainland lobsterman Bill Butman, who asked nothing in return. On one instance, my mother went ashore for a doctor's appointment. The weather turned for the worst, and Dad found himself alone with the baby for three days. He quickly learned tending to a baby was far more challenging than tending to a lighthouse. 
Almost weekly, Dad petitioned the base commander for a boat. How can I be the Coast Guard when I don't have a boat? The commander would always give the same response. You're a lighthouse keeper now. You don't need a boat. Finally, in August, being the squeaky wheel paid off, and Whitehead Light Station got their boat. It leaked a bit, and the engine kept stalling, but at least now they had a boat. Just a ways up the coast in Camden, kids from Burley Hill Sailing Camp awoke to a record low temperature of 43 degrees. The chilly morning was both a blessing and a curse. The campers bundled up to keep warm. Hurricane Cleo had been threatening the east coast all week, but now the cold temperatures were pushing it out to sea. The campers would soon be heading for Tenants Harbor. They were on their next to last leg of a week-long sailing trip that would take them back to Booth Bay. Although they awoke to sunshine, weather conditions were far from ideal. There was a brisk breeze and the waves were building. Requests from some of the boat captains to stay in Camden one more night were denied by the camp director. The end of summer was fast approaching and parents would soon be arriving to pick up their children. The Debbie was first out of the harbor but they encountered a problem with the rigging and the other boats passed on by. When the powerboat came up alongside to offer help, the problem was fixed, so they waved him off. As the day progressed, the weather continued to worsen. Winds were reported gusting up to 40 miles per hour with waves as high as 15 feet. The passing storm swelled tides two feet above normal. The determined crew aboard the Debbie continued on. They consisted of two teenage girls, Leslie Lewis and Susan Cheever, and two teenage boys, Jeffrey Stark and Dan Granoff. The captain was camp counselor, Peter Leyland. A little further along the route, they lost a crucial piece of equipment, their bailing can to help scoop water that washed over the bow. They had nothing left to bail with, but a sponge and their bare hands. The other boats had raced ahead and were now far out of sight. Two of them would have their own troubles later that day and would need to be towed to safety by the camp power boat. It had been a busy day for the Coast Guardsmen on Whitehead Light Station. It was time to relax a bit before dinner and the evening chores. Alan Calter was trying to beat my father at horseshoes. My sister Becky was sleeping nearby in her playpen. My mother was down along the edge of the water picking berries. She spotted a tiny sailboat making its way out into the open ocean. No place she would want to be on a day like this. But they looked to be doing okay, so she went back to picking her berries. Back on the sailboat Debbie, the young crew was chilled to the bone from the wet spray coming over the bow all afternoon. They were standing in water almost to their knees. To keep up their courage, they sang songs. My father was the keeper of the Eddystone Light, and he slept with the mermaid one fine night. From this union there came three, a porpoise and a porky, and the other was me. Go up, the wind blows free, oh fair life on the rolling sea. With one final wave over the bow, the boat groaned a glass gasp and the Debbie was swamped. Leslie, Susan, and Dan were thrown into the water, while Peter and Jeffrey clung to the bow. While life jackets they had started to blow away in the wind, Dan grabbed one that was flying by and put it on. He swam a hundred feet to retrieve another one. Just as he got there, the weight of his extra clothes from the early morning chill pulled him under. Panicking, he struggled to kick off his pants and unneeded clothing. 
he popped up to the surface, gasping for air. Watching his clothes float away, he brought back the other life jacket and put it on Leslie. My mother looked up from her berries and scanned the horizon. Something didn't look right. She ran to the house, grabbed the binoculars, and looked out. The sailboat wasn't moving and the mast was gone. She ran yelling to my father, Russell, there's a sailboat in trouble. I think there are people in the water. My father started running and barking out orders to Alan. Call Rockland and Burn Island. Get rescue boats coming. He then ran to the other side of the island where the boat was kept. He knew it was underpowered and no match for the heavy surf, but he had no choice and was going to attempt the rescue. All the way there, he kept wishing that he had a bigger boat. When he got there, alongside the dock was a bigger boat, a lobster boat. He looked around and saw a young man on the other side of the cove. Dad yelled out across the way. 16-year-old David Gamage came running. It was his grandfather's lobster boat. Dad explained the situation and asked to commandeer the boat. Instinctively, David jumped aboard and my father followed. They started the engine, cast off the lines, and were soon racing out of the harbor. Meanwhile, back in the sailboat Debbie, they had been in the water for over an hour. Tossed about by the waves, the situation seemed hopeless. The weather was rough. It was late in the afternoon. They were frightened and exhausted and the cold Atlantic was draining the life from their bodies. All eyes were on Leslie. She was shaking, turning blue, and faintly weeping. It looked like at any moment she would let go of the boat and fade away into the deep. As the lobster boat Mabel battled the waves, the engine suddenly sputtered to a stop. There at the mercy of the ocean, my father and David looked at each other wide-eyed. David looked down and saw that a hammer had fallen off the dashboard. It hit the throttle and it killed the engine. He started it once again and they continued on. Just when the five teenagers thought all hope was lost, they saw an angel coming. It was a boat racing towards them with the spray coming off the bow looking like angel wings. They all started yelling and screaming for help. All of a sudden, Lop's boat turned away and went the other direction. Don't they see us? Their hearts fell into despair. On the lobster boat Mabel, my father yelled to David, Hey, where are you going? They pointed at the ledges, just barely hidden underneath the water. He navigated around them and aimed back at the sailboat Debbie. Knowing they were finally rescued, the crew from the stable Debbie were silent, each thanking God for his kindness. My father and David pulled up alongside. It took all the strength they could muster to lift the water-soaked, exhausted teenagers aboard. The crew huddled together around the engine's exhaust while Dad tied a rope on the Debbie's bow. David put the Mabel in gear, and they started towing the sailboat behind them. With the Debbie mostly underwater, the weight was too much, and the tow rope snapped. Leslie continued to sob, and it stopped shaking. Concerned for her, they abandoned the Debbie and raced back to the island. Once back at the lighthouse, my mother took Susan and Leslie to her bedroom. She opened her bureau drawer and said, take what you need. Leslie disappeared in the bathroom, where she became violently ill. My mother rendered what aid she could. Meanwhile, David and Dad went back out on the stormy sea to rescue the sailboat Debbie. Inside the lighthouse, the campers were wrapped in blankets and sipping hot tea. Looking out the window, they saw a powerboat coming from the direction of Tenant's Harbor. It weaved around the waves as if looking for something. It stopped and picked something up out of the water. It sped off and disappeared to the backside of the island. It was a camp power boat. They had found a floorboard from the Debbie. Thinking the worst, they were coming back to report the missing sailboat and the crew to the Coast Guard. When they arrived at the harbor, 
they found the sailboat tied to a mooring and the news that the crew were safe in the lighthouse. The commander from Rockland arrived in a rescue boat. The excitement was over for the day, but Alan and my father still had those evening chores to do. The day after the rescue was like any other day. Mother found herself baking a pie with those berries. Dad was doing chores. It's almost like the rescue never happened. But the chest that held the winter blankets was now empty. And there were a few less clothes in my mother's bureau drawer. Hopefully they could save enough money to replace those blankets before snow flies. And my mother said she had enough clothes anyway. By now the kids that were rescued were probably back at camp or heading home, wherever that was. At the Rockland Coast Guard Station, a petty officer was typing a letter of commendation that never quite made its way into my father's file. There was no fanfare, no medals. Why would there be? He was just doing his job, tending light off the coast of Maine. I never did live on the island. Dad was transferred before I was born, but he assures me I am a product of Whitehead Light Station. As we approached the dock some 57 years after the rescue, I was not prepared for the flood of emotion. The island seemed like my home as Dad's stories came to life. I did find there was more than one hero that day. There was a young mother with a watchful eye on the ocean who offered all she had in an open palm. There was a brave 16-year-old at the wheel with more knowledge of the island and its waters than someone twice his age, passed down from his father and grandfather. There was a young lighthouse keeper haunted by the memory of losing his best friend overboard while serving on a destroyer in the Korean War. He vowed never to feel that helpless again. And there was a boatload of teenagers who were lifted up and out of the unforgiving ocean. And they were given a second chance to grow up to be heroes in their own right. And finally, I had the privilege to take my parents back to the place they once called home on Whitehead Island. My mother was 20 again, and dad looked strong and full of life. As I stood there between David Gamage and my father, I was struck by how humble these men were. Maybe that's part of what being a true hero is all about. And I finally had an answer for Dad's words that haunted me from so long ago. Don't be like me, son. Go make something of yourself. Your brother, Harry Bailey, broke through the ice and was drowned at the age of nine. That's a lie. Harry Bailey went to war. He got the Congressional Medal of Honor. He saved the lives of every man on that transport. Every man on that transport died. Harry wasn't there to save them because you weren't there to save Harry. Don't you see, Dad? You really did have a wonderful life. There he is. Hi. How are you? Good to see you again. Been a while. Been a while. <laughs> yes, it has. Yeah. Can you believe it all? No, I can't believe it anymore. You were 16. A couple of years ago. <laughs> <laughs>
you so from that when I see you all this time. How on earth are you? Uh, Oh, Hi. 57 years. I don't know what that's I got to have a hug. Oh. Hi. Hi. How are you I doing? I just can't believe it. We just had all these, all these years. Wow. <laughs> they look just the same. Good to hear. Yeah, we we, uh, we first went out to Whitehead Light Station uh, in uh, 2014. It's Open Lighthouse Day. It was so peaceful out there and so beautiful. And uh, Adirondack chairs all over the place. And we just had to go back as you, and spend a long weekend there staying at the lighthouse and all the various programs. If you haven't had a chance, um, I know uh, Henry sent uh, their website out with the notice of this webinar. And they have uh, a number of programs that they run out there. Um, you know, things like knitting and beer making and yoga and all kinds of things. And uh, when we went out the, to stay that first weekend, we went with streeters and fosters and, and uh, we said, you know, all these people are coming out here to a lighthouse to have these programs and you ought to have a lighthouse program. And so we kind of talked them into getting Jeremy Detrimont to talk about New England lights. And he, did start programs out there. We went to the first one in 2015, three couples again, and everybody else who's there. And I put together a, a, some of the film from these visits and want to share it with you. And it's it's peaceful music and it's uh, it's very much like staying at the light out there. And uh, we also from Nell made some grants of at least five thousand dollars. Probably I think it was for the lantern room restoration out there and perhaps there was something about the whistle house too I seem to remember but I didn't find anything on it in particular. So there we go. All right. Yep, we hear it. The birds you hear around the music CD.
beautiful place to study. You gotta do this if you haven't ever done it. Duplex keeper's house, and they opened the wall so there's a double stairwell from each of the separate dwellings that were there. Bedrooms are all beautiful, clean, simple, but very comfortable. Mel's grant repaired all that rust that you see. This movie's from 2012, so it's ways back.
Jewish lighthouse over on that island. out there, a little residence at the time, they have a new building now, and walking the island is through the forest and the moss and ferns. Fire off the mainland. They take you on cruises. Um, 
just want to be sure everybody can hear me. No? See that cut in stone right under there? It's not. It's like that used to be part of the dock. That's what I'm saying. There's cut stone like that all over, just like that bollard. There's cut stone like that all over this island. Where they just, I like that chimney. That these? They started cutting and then yeah. just left it. Quit. I can't believe uh, it. I don't want to go here. We can hear you, Tom. Okay. They take you on cruises, and this one went out to an island. It was an old quarry, and you can see the uh, the old foundations overgrown these giant trees now. That's the quarry hole, water filled. This was the guy's uh, recognizable dock area from the previous yeah, islands here. Here. traveling around. Everybody the, the just Boston put your hands out before you jump. <laughs> oh, now that's better. We got under. Now we can at least see. And after we get through, if we keep up with the speed, mm -hmm. you see to the left the pole sitting there, there's a hermit. Mm -hmm. yeah. Everybody was trying to get the best, clearest picture of the moon. The only heat is the two wood stoves in the building.
How does a uh, five minute follow up from our last trip out there? Spirit of Alaska. <laughs> this one's a little different. It's got music, vocals. Stopped at Owl's Head on our way down to go out in the boat on the mainland at about noon, so stayed in the rock the night before.
the bowl Polishing the glass Polishing the glass Keep the brass bell shining bright Ships to steer clear. If the storm clouds should appear, I am the lighthouse keeper and I live alone. I will walk these steps and work these hands to the bone. Polishing the glass. I am going with the flow I am turning like a gear I could scream but no one would hear me I am a lighthouse keeper And I live alone I will walk these steps and work these hands to the bone Polishing the glass Polishing the glass Come back and see us again. Everybody should go. Well, thank you, Tom. That was great. I hope you liked it. We did. I'm sure. Anybody I hope have? You liked it, Russ. Getting back out there for that one time we met you out there, and uh, that was great. Thank you 15. so much. That was excellent. I loved that. It's, it's such a peaceful place. It it really captures it. I think too. Mm. In, in that, and there's so many things to do. All the we did that lighthouse puzzles on the table in the parlor and. Uh, it was just a good time. Huh?